Without further ado, let's jump right into this. Many here are familiar with our purpose as an organization. I'm hoping that every, if I say, why does Rockfish Church exist? I'm hoping that, that 90% of you could jump right up and say, you know what? We exist to make, equip, and release fully committed followers of Jesus. That's what this series is all about. If we're going to be committed to, to making, releasing, to making, equipping, and releasing fully committed followers, well, I think we really need to be able to functionally define what a fully committed follower of Jesus is, right? We really want to understand what our goal is to produce. Not only that, we want to be those fully committed followers of Jesus. We want to be all in for Jesus. We believe that this is his purpose for us. We believe that it is his call out of his word directly to be disciples, fully committed followers of him. What does that mean? It means absolutely nothing off the table. It means all in. It means, it means God, this is my life and there's nothing in my life that I'm going to declare off limits to you. I'm giving your grace, your provision, your power, your conviction, full access to every aspect of my life. That's all in as far as God is concerned. Dan talked last week about commitment to God, about loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, about focusing on his desires for you, for what he wants. If complete commitment to God is going to become a reality, there are three areas of commitment and conformity that I can promise you you're going to struggle in. All right? The struggle is real. We here at Rockfish Church are very intentional when it comes to equipping you for the real issues that you're going to face in life. There are going to be three things that I can promise you you're going to face, and I want to deal with those. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. There are several. But one, if you're going to be all in with God, you are going to struggle to embrace fully God's will. So we're going to look at being fully committed to God's will. The second area, we are going to look at being fully committed to God's way. Those are intricately linked. And third, we're going, to be looking, we're going to be dealing with being fully committed to God's, and this is one of the toughest. It's one of the toughest. This is the thing that, that this is the dash in between the dates of possibility. We're going to be looking at full, full commitment to God's timing. Uh, I don't know about you, but timing is very, very tough for me. I want it now, I want it here, but patience is, is a fruit of the Spirit that is an absolute necessity for us if we're going to be all in for God. God's will, God's way, God's timing. These are three areas that we are, the struggle is real in, and I'm going to be very, very candid, and we're going to get very, very raw in some areas today. Uh, so don't judge me, and I won't judge you yet. All right, let's talk about the will. Does anyone here ever struggle between what you should do and what you want to do? Well, that's probably most of us. The rest of you, you're not paying attention. Uh, do you ever struggle between what you should do and what you... I went on a... I'll give you an example. I went on a uh, vacation recently. I went on a cruise. I love going on cruises. I'm just telling you. I'm, Lord, forgive me, but I do. But when you go on a cruise, if you've ever been on a cruise, you realize they have all kinds of incredible food. Jesus, help me. I mean, seafood night, they got lobster tails. And I'm, I'm just going to be honest. I know that I should stop after plate number three. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. C come on. I know I should stop at least with plate number four. But, <laughs> but I don't want to. I know I should stop with that and not go to the ice cream machine. But it's such good ice cream. All right. All right. Anyway. It's at that point when you're struggling between what you want to and what you should do is where the wheel is engaged. This is why we're talking about this. It happens every single day in a plethora of very, very different circumstances. Every one of you know this struggle is real. That's why we're going to talk to you about it and equip you for it in a very real, real way. We're going to be talking about God's will. We're going to be talking about our will. So let's begin by defining two very important aspects of the will. What is the will? Number one. The will, as in context of what we're going to be discussing, is a determined set of desires. I'll give you an example. The Word of God says in 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4, something like this. It is God's will that none of, none of you people in this room, it is God's determined desire that none of you should die and go to hell. 
It is God's determined will that everybody in this room would repent and accept God's free gift of salvation. That is the will of God, a determined set of desires. That's one aspect of the will when I'm talking about. And the second one is it is a mechanism by which we choose between two desires. Some people go, well, I don't know if you have free will or not. I'm going to settle this great theological debate right now. McDonald's, Taco Bell, choose. See, right there. Anyway, somebody's going to be mad at me over that. I don't care. I'm not going to argue about that. As far as you know, you got it. Does it matter? Not really. Here's the point. Your will is a mechanism by which we choose between the desires that manifest in our life. Some desires are the ones we want to, and some desires are the ones we should do. So something happens. So let's look at a current reality that we all know is true. God's will and my will are often in conflict. Amen? Look, look, this is just, we, just, we, we should just talk about this. You should feel guilty because I, I want to I I slap the life out of somebody. That's what I desire. When the Bible tells me, you know what, you should turn the other cheek. Well, both desires are real. Part of me says, I want to turn the other cheek like Jesus wants me to. That's the should do. But the want to is sometimes very different. Will comes into play. What is your ultimate desire will determine your ultimate choice. Did you hear me? God's will and his his desire that we be generous. God said it is better for you to give than it is to receive, right? He's talking about money. Oh, hush. It's God's will that we should be generous. It is my will that I should be generous too, just to me first. Some of you got that. Some of you will leave and get that in the parking lot. (laughs) Do you see? That's my desire. God's desire. I know I should be generous to others, but my desire is to be generous to me. Hallelujah. We're going to be doing a series. It's called Me, Myself, and I. We are going to be talking about putting the me monster to death. That's coming up. You might as well just, you might as well put that on your calendar. Not sure what month it is, but you'll hear about it soon. The third part, let's see. It's God's will for me to freely forgive. Right? It's God's will, and you know it. But I am inclined to revenge. I, I, I'm a man enough to say that. My desire to forgive is offset by my desire to get you back. All right? Any, y'all, anybody have that struggle? Is that real for anybody? I know. Y'all so holy, you don't have to worry about that. I do. I still struggle. All right. See, I love the Word of God because it brings real insight into real problems that we experience in this world. And that is, that is what is so powerful. That's why Christianity and the Word of God is so powerful. Because it works in this real world. We get real world answers and application from the Word of God. Not some, some nebulous spirituality that sounds good from some silver-tongued orator. We get real solutions to real problems because God knows how this thing works. Amen? Galatians 5.17. I, I find great solace in this. So what we've talked about, I got from the Bible. He told me. We know this. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another for a particular reason. you got to realize there's a reason so that you may not do. Now we're going to be talking about ways next week so that you may not do the things that you please. You will never do until you get past the the desire. Okay? Not according to will. Now listen to this. For the flesh sets the desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. If you are born again, if you have committed to God, if you desire to be all in and do what pleases God, that's born of Him, but it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I believe many of us in here desire to do what is right, but we also have other desires working on the inside of us. It's very important. I want to define, if, you, if, if I can, for just a minute what the flesh is. The flesh is, is kind of interesting. The flesh is, is those things that naturally occur, those natural tendencies on the inside of us that are inherently opposed to what God wants for our life. The Spirit is something different. It is, it is God's desire manifested in our lives. The Spirit represents the revelation of God's desires in your life. That's what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God brings to life in the face of the want to do wrong, 
the what to do that is glorifying God. And it's important. So there are three things about the desire, and that's what we're just talking about. Two sources of inspiration. The flesh, which is, again, the natural tendencies. Every single man, woman, and child has them. The tendency to lie. Let's just be honest. We don't want to fess up. We want to cover up, right? But the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. He says confession is good for the soul, good for the whole person. Do you see what we want to and what we should do, the struggle? Two sources of inspiration. The other source, again, is the Spirit of God, which is the revelation of God's desires in us through the presence of His Spirit. So it's what we call being born again. And this is very functional in nature. Number two, they are always hostile. That's what it, that's what it told us in that scripture. These, uh, let, me, let me paint a picture. These guys are not buddies. Your flesh and your spirit are not buddies. This is going to be a bloody, knock-down, drag-out confrontation. I want, you to, I want you to just imagine for a visual here, a man standing here, a strong man with strong desires, strong agendas, and strong attentions and intentions. Another man, strong man, clear desires, intentions that are absolutely opposite of the other one, and they are chained together with an unbreakable chain. The direction will be determined by the one who wins the battle. One will die, one will live, and you will take that path, or he'll exercise his desires, or it won't die, and you'll stay in the middle of that struggle forever. Okay? We know this. The struggle is real. The struggle is present with every single one of us. Now, again, picture two different people with two very different agendas wanting to go in two very different directions. They are always hostile. That's normal, okay? That's normal. Paul described it. He said, those things that I want to do, I don't do. Those things I know I should do, I find myself buffeted by my very own desires, and it's frustrating, and I get it. Got some good news, though. We'll get to that in just a minute. Number three, desires carry con consequences. Now, the fact is we are going to choose one of the two present desires that come up in every situation. One of the desires is going to be the one that you follow, the one that you embrace. That's when the will comes into play. That's when you're exercising that will, the expression of, of choosing which one of those desires. We'll talk about how that, how that works and what it looks like. Romans 8.13 says this, and this is why understanding that there are consequences are important. Because let's look at the two, two consequences. If you follow the desires of that fallen nature, if you are living, executing according to the desires, manifesting the desires, living out the desires according to the flesh that are there naturally, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death... The deeds, the actions, the desires of the body, you will live. Two desires, two predetermined sets of consequences. Here we are in the middle of that. How important is your will? What does that look like? Simply put, following God leads to life. Following your will leads to death. I have some really good news though. Number one. God really understands the struggle. I find great solace in this. Guys, this is good news. This is not one of those sermons where you're going to, this is, this is great. You're going to really enjoy this. God really understands the real life struggle that every man, woman, and child who ever comes into this earth is experiencing. And you experience it. You'll experience it today. Maybe already. Maybe your wife or your husband said something on the way here and you wanted to poke them in the nose. And the Spirit of God said, don't poke them. <laughs> All right, anyway. Uh, number two, this is the good news. He has equipped us for the fight. God has given us the ability. He's given us the tools. He's given us the, he's given us the, the equipment and the knowledge to not only engage but to win this fight because he has declared before time began that you are called and destined to be more than a conqueror, more than an overcomer. That's good news. So let's figure this thing out. These are the words of Jesus in John 6.38. This is important. Jesus said, speaking of himself, 
For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Christ is our forerunner. He is our example. This was not just his attitude for him. This was his expectation for every single man, woman, and child who he knew would say, I want to be all in. You should be able to right here. He expects, and I'm going to show you this in just a minute. He expects every one of us to be able to say, for Tony has come down from the Father. Do you realize that you are, if you are born of the Spirit of God, you are from God? Now listen, you're his ambassador. You're his representative on earth. That's his words, not mine, just as Jesus was. Jesus said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will. We, if we're going to be all in, we have to say, I have not come to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Listen to what he said in Luke 9, 23. And he was saying to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he said, if anybody is going to be my disciple, let him deny his will, deny himself, take up his cross, and daily follow me. Three very definitive steps. This tells us three simple things. One, we must surrender our will, our want to her. We must surrender our desires Number two, and embrace his desires. Okay, it's about, this is about desires. Okay, embrace it. Your desires are going to be fulfilled by what you focus your attention on. He's saying, look, surrender your will. Get your focus off of your will. If your mind is on your flesh, guess what you're going to be doing? You're going to be tendering, catering to the flesh. If your mind is on the spirit, guess what you're going to be? You're going to be focusing on the things that are pleasing to the spirit. This tells us, again, three simple things. Surrender to his will, embrace his will, and three, execute his purpose. Here's the reality. If you do not deny yourself, if you do not take on his will, his cross, his burdens, his values, you will never follow him. You will never manifest or execute his will in this earth. You will be in that place where you never accomplish anything. Remember, the spirit and the flesh are at odds. Why? Because so that you cannot do what you want to do. So he said, be doers of the word, not just people with good intentions. And we've allowed our, our desires to complicate our lives and make us people with good intentions and very few actions. You see, when we embrace this reality, all of a sudden our communities begin to change. Our world begins to change. We get about the Father's business. Jesus said, it is my meat, it is my bread, my sustenance to do what is pleasing to my Father. So fully committed to God means saying no to me, yes to God. Listen to this, and I know you're going to find this hard to believe. Even when I don't feel like it. Anybody ever not feel like it? Okay, good. And here's my point. Detachment from feelings brings clarity during temptation. It is an absolute necessity because your feelings are very often contrary. Think about it this way. The world says, follow your heart. (laughs) Do what feels good. Now, this is a very scientific uh, inquiry here. This is empirical study at its finest. If anybody has ever done what they felt like doing and it ended very, very badly, raise your hand. Uh, Okay, all right, there you go. Empirical study, 101. I have followed my feelings, and it has gotten me into a mess. Some of you this morning followed your feelings, and you said what you wanted to say to your spouse. And that's why there's that much space between you and them right now. (laughs) What would happen if you said everything you felt like saying? I would have a black eye right now. You understand? I'm just saying, I'm just, anyway, the world says follow your heart, but let me tell you, the Bible teaches us that God loves us enough to tell us that our hearts are working against us. Let me explain it to you this way. The heart, God in his candor and his love for us has said this, he has said, he said, do you understand that the very desires on the inside of you are kind of like this? They want you to drink poison. Your very nature, your will ends in death. So those desires that if you allow them to compel you are paramount or, or are equivalent to those desires. Or Remember, the wages of sin, pay for sin, is death. 
In other words, what it's saying is when you do this, you're literally drinking poison to your own detriment. That's what happens when we follow our will. And the, God loves us enough to tell us that. I don't try to correct my children because I don't want them to have fun. It will kill them. I tell them not to drink Clorox, but everything in them wants to drink Clorox because it tastes good. But it has bad ramifications on the bowels. You understand? <laughs> anyway. So there's three things about our feelings, and this is huge. You've got to get this. One, please rel- realize you are not your feelings. I'm going to go a step further. You are not your thoughts. The Bible says casting down every thought and every imagination. It says bring into submission every thought and every imagination that exalts itself against the desires of God. Most of those desires are our desires which are contrary to God. It says hostily deal with every thought. So I come to a revelation. Thoughts that are contrary to the will of God being executed in my life on my behalf and behalf of others are not from the enemy. They are the enemy. And we should deal with them as such. We should deal with them with the hostility that God intended. Your feelings are not you. Think about this. Your feelings are constantly changing. Therefore, your feelings make a very poor God. They're always changing. Always changing the goal line. Your feelings change according to your situation. Or your condition. Therefore they are inadequate when it comes to leading you with clarity. Number two. And this should be obvious for some people it's not. Feelings do not justify behavior. Well Pastor Tony. I feel like speeding. Hey guys. Any of you in here just sometimes just feel like going fast. Hmm. Ladies you understand that. Sometimes we are compelled just to go fast. I was, I was having a moment, and I said to my kids, guys, I'm selling the minivans. <laughs> I got three. Lord, forgive me, two minivans and a conversion van. I said, I'm selling the vans, and I'm buying a sports car. Glory. That, sound, that was a revelation from heaven. Sell them. My boy looked at me and said, why, Dad? You can't speed. (laughs) I have failed as a father. I said, maybe not, but I can get to the limit really, really fast. (laughs) Come on. Come on. I can go zero to 70 on the freeway in some areas of North Carolina between here and Florida. Maybe 90. Jesus, forgive me. That's why we have grace. No, I'm kidding. All right, here we go. Um, Feelings do not justify your behavior because I don't care how how much you feel like going fast. My boy knew something. You can feel like going fast, but there's consequences. Just because you feel like it doesn't justify your doing it. I feel like retiring. That doesn't mean I can go rob a bank. Hallelujah. All right. You follow that wherever it applies to your life. Holy Spirit, take them there right now. Okay, here we go. Number three, feelings. And this is, this is one of the most important things. Feelings will rob you of reality. Reality is, is beyond perception. It is how things really are. Your feelings, I don't feel like she loves me. She ain't left you yet. She ain't killed you in your sleep. He still goes to work, still sends that paycheck. In his mind, that's love. I'm just, look, we ain't got a whole lot to give. I ain't got a whole lot of feelings and emotions to give you, but I can give you some money. Hallelujah. All right, I'm just saying, all right. Feelings will rob you of reality. Your feelings will lie to you. Jesus was absolutely fully committed to the Father. This is, this is very important. Jesus refused to allow his desires and his feelings to deter him. You say, well, Pastor Tony, Jesus did. God didn't struggle with what we struggle with. Really? I can't explain it, but I'm going to read something to you here that's going to blow your mind. We get a glimpse into the greatest conflict of wills that ever took place on behalf of humanity in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 39. I'm going to set the scene for you a little bit, but Jesus was about to experience a horrifically painful, horribly painful death. Guys, this was not a story for him in the Bible. 
This was real. Jesus was hours away from experiencing what he knew was going to be a horribly excruciating death. Do you realize that where Jesus grew up, he probably saw people crucified? He probably saw the manner in which he knew he would die executed on men, and, and, and it was very real to him. As real as if you knew that you walk out of that door and somebody's waiting there to take you somewhere and take your life ultimately. It's not a story. And the pressures and the desires are real and everything in him wanted to run away. Listen to what he says in Matthew 26, 39. It says, and he went a little beyond them. And he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, my father. He appealed to his relationship. Daddy. This breaks my heart as a father. Daddy, if it is possible, if there's, if there's any other way, let this cup, let, let this execution of your desires, let it pass. Please let me out of it. Yet, this is, this is it. This is it. Yet not as I will but as you will. In the face of all his feelings, in the face of his tendency, in the face of every option, the one that he desired above all, the one that he focused on, the one that he wanted above all was the one that God empowered him to execute. Think how differently our lives would be. Do you realize at that moment, if that doesn't occur, if that occurs any other way, we're not sitting in this room right now. We remain in hopeless, helpless Detachment from God. The Bible goes on to describe the inner turmoil and temptation. It tells us that it was so intense that it resulted in literal, literal blood coming through his pores. It says no man has, re has resisted the temptation to run like Christ resisted it on behalf of humanity. You know, this candid one, I thank God that this is there. I thank God that he was candid enough to put this in his word to show us how real this struggle is and then to offer us the realities of hope in the, in the middle of this struggle. So there are four things, four important things that this tells us concerning being all in for God. Complete commitment requires sacrifice. Jesus said it this way. He said, you count the cost. I'm just going to give my life to Jesus because I'm having bad circumstances. Well, your circumstances could end up being a lot worse because to follow Jesus will cost you something. It may cost you everything. I, I love you enough to tell you that. If, you, if, if following Christ isn't costing you something, even a portion of your will, then you're doing it wrong. Well, that's not nice. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said it this way. He said, I consider everything outside of the will of God for my life garbage. He used even stronger language. I'm not going to use that because there's a child sitting on the front row right here. He said, I consider everything that opposes God's will for my life outside of the person of Jesus Christ. I consider it garbage. That's every desire. It's every platitude, it's every opportunity, it's every position, it's everything that this world and the desires that are consistent with this world, everything they have to offer, I reckon them as garbage. He understood sacrifice, it will also cost you faith. And I'm not talking about any kind of faith, I'm talking about intentional faith in these areas. Faith is the ability to trust God in, if we're going to be all in, in the area of His love. Because guess what? Circumstances are going to look like God doesn't love you. If God loves me, why would he let me go through this? Half of it we got ourselves into. Why are we blaming God for it anyway? Because we follow the wrong desires. I'm just throwing that out there. And even if you do follow God fully, this world and this life is not the end. He wants to use this to develop you into a creature of eternity that glorifies him accurately. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. We must have faith in God's intentions. Whatever he brought you to, he will bring you through. And it will accomplish what he intends. That's why you've got to have faith in his love and faith in his intentions. And number three, you've got to have faith in God's abilities. 
See, one thing about Abraham, Abraham was counted faithful because he believed God could do what he told him he would do. If you are going to follow God's desires, you're going to need God's ability to do so. You understand, it is not a matter of your willpower. Your will is simply a mechanism of submission. And number three, you must have faith in God's plan no matter what we're facing. You've got to understand that God has an intended greater later, whatever the now might look like. A lesser now. Don't sacrifice your greater later for the lesser now, please. We do it so many times. There's a story of Esau who was faithless, who questioned God and questioned God's plan and sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. For a moment of instant gratification, he gave up the incredible greater later that God had. And God didn't like that. But we do that. We give up something incredible in our marriage. We give up something incredible in our relationship with God for a, for a moment of selfish gratification and giving in to desires. And there's a cost to it. Number, number three, vision. Vision is the ability to see beyond. Beyond the temporary pleasure to the eternal reward. Beyond the temporary pain to the eternal potential. Beyond the fear of death to the promise of life. That's the kind of vision that we're called to have. If you're going to be all in, you better have that. Do you understand that, the, that certain cults in the world have a better understanding of death and a better attitude concerning it than we who are Christians who will never experience the kind of death that they think? You understand that if you are born again, Jesus said, you will never die. We are not held captive to the fear of death. The vision given to us by God's purpose and God's plan and God's word should, should absolutely free us if we have any other attitude concerning death other than this. To live as Christ, to die as gain. Don't you go cry over a, over a Christian who has died. If you do, that's fine. You just mourn knowing that it's for your loss, not theirs. Come on. You know people who have honored God. Their life is a testament to that. And you go crying and it don't even feel good. You may cry because you miss their influence, but it is better for them just like it's better for us. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Do you see what happens if we as believers no longer fear death? Then a coronavirus doesn't stop us from evangelizing the world. It becomes God's mechanism to reach deeper into the world. When they recoil in fear, we go, we will love not our lives unto death. We will glorify God wherever, whenever, and however he says. Restraint, gone. Enemy has no power of, over you in the area of death. Death has lost its sting. Therefore, how should we live? With reckless abandon for his causes. Amen? Last one. I'm going to camp out here for just a minute. And this is where y'all can get mad at me. Or we can get very, very real. This is where the Holy Ghost comes in and he speaks to you and he speaks to me. Patience. Grit. This world needs some gritty Christians. If we are going to be completely committed to God, we must walk in patience. That is the ability to stand in the face of temptation and desires. We must have grit. The world needs committed followers who love God more than they fear death. Who want God's will above their agenda. Who want conformity to God more than the comforts of their flesh. Who execute the great commission without condition. I'm, I'm going to share something with you. We're talking about desires. We're going to get down to the nitty gritty. If you had not heard anything else I've said, I want you to hear what I'm about to say right now. Wake up. If it's an option, you'll take it. Your willpower will fail you. If it is an option, listen to me, you'll take it. No longer an option means no longer a temptation. See, some of you are struggling. Some of you are enslaved by your desires. The Bible says, reckon or consider yourself dead unto sin. See, so those desires of the spirit and those desires of the flesh in your life, here's what it looks like. You want to wound them, but you don't want to kill them. 
See, there's desires that, that you, you, don't want them, you don't want them to be completely gone because, let me tell you, those desires alive in your life will stop you from going into the destiny that God has for you. But some of you have wanted to wound it, but you haven't wanted to kill it. Don't bring a lame sacrifice to God. You put to death by the power of the Spirit the desires of the flesh. You've got to kill it. When it is no longer an option, it is no longer a temptation. I'm going to be real. Don't use this against me. When I got saved, I come to Christ, I smoked like a freight train. You say, well, well Pastor Tony, will smoking send you to hell? I don't know, but it will send you to heaven a lot quicker. <laughs> I just know this. When I lit up, the Spirit spoke up. I said, that's not the perfect plan for your life. You're going to ruin your testimony. It's not doing good for you. And I knew better. And I was like, okay. And, and let me tell you, the day that it was no longer an option is the day that His grace showed up and I was free. It had to die. When it is no longer an option, it's no longer a temptation. Another one. Guys, I used to drink like a fish. Like I had the same problems. But the day that it was no longer an option is the day that I, in full faith, not in my willpower, but in God's provision, said, God, I will take this off the table if you will put your provision on the table. I will let go of this self-soothing behavior if you, God, will come in and be everything that I need. I can't do this. I've tried. I've given in to these desires. He said, if it's no longer an option, it will no longer be a temptation because I am faithful. I will show up in the middle of your mess with my provision, and I will bring what you need moment by moment. I used to cuss like a sailor or an infantryman. You've got to remember where you are. Well, Pastor Tony, that's our culture here at Fort Bragg. Let no profane or unwholesome speech come out of your mouth as a culture of the kingdom. You stop using that garbage as an excuse when it's no longer an option, it's no longer a temptation. Well, Pastor Tony, it sounds like you're, you're getting into works. Let me tell you, I'm getting into freedom. Because let me tell you something, every time you give in to those desires, you give up your boldness to speak on his behalf. The world deserves gritty Christians. Those desires that you've been dragging around, fighting with, pulling you in and out of the agenda of God, stopping you from manifesting everything God intended you to manifest and be everything God manifested, manifested you to be and to do. Reckon yourself dead. Stand if you're able. Uh, well, let's, let's do this. Okay, listen, I, I don't, I, this is not personal. This has nothing to do with me, but some of you, some of you, as I talk about this, the Holy Spirit has shown you that you are absolutely a slave to desires that do not glorify God. You have loved it. You've drug it along with you so you could go back and make out with it. It's time to reckon it dead through the power of the Almighty God. Listen, listen. If you know, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and there is something that you are willing to reckon yourself dead to in full expectation of the provision and the grace of God coming into your life and setting you free. And you want to be free because <laughs> whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Raise your hand. Keep your hand up real high. If the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, listen, I'm not going to ask, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to, my hand's up. I'm not going to ask you to say out loud what it is to me or come up here and do anything crazy. This is your heart because this is your future because this is your relationship between you and your almighty God. He knows every thought, every imagination of our, of our cruddy little hearts. There's nothing hid. It's all open and naked before Him. If there is something that you are willing to say, God, it is no longer an option in full expectation of your provision, raise your hand, hold it up high, and pray with me, okay? We're going to do this. I'm going to do this. Y'all ready? The word amen means so be it. At the end of this prayer, I'm going to say amen. If you're willing to, to consider, to reckon that thing dead, you're willing to, in faith, in full reliance on God's provision, say goodbye to that and begin to move in everything. To say amen at the end of this prayer. It just means you agree. Father, 
God of glory, grace, and mercy, this is not about our willpower, but God, you know the desires that war inside of us. Father God, there are men and women all over this worship center who want to be free to do everything and to be everything that you've called them to be. God, they are willing to say right now, this is no longer an option. They say it by faith, believing God, that in the middle of that temptation, as they exercise the fruit of the Spirit, which is patience, as they walk in grit, that you are going to show up in the middle of that mess, that your help and your provision is on the way, no matter what it feels like in that moment. God, they are willing to say, I am no longer going to forsake the greater later for the meager now. Father, I ask you to pour out your spirit and your power upon them. Give them great grace right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And everybody who wants to make that theirs, say amen. Amen. Amen.